Hey, this is Craig. If you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. If you're a business owner and you want to increase your cash flow, or if you're a label or artist and you want to promote new music, then listen up. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, Go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area, in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, The 7 Biggest Mistakes Homeowners Make When Hiring a Realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on The 21 Most Expensive Mistakes Tampa Home Buyers Make When Buying a Home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the 7 most important things to consider when hiring a realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's WestFloridaRealEstate.com. Yeah. All right, let's do this. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, man. I have got such an amazingly talented player with us today. It's a real treat, and he's also the sweetest, gentlest guy you'll ever meet. We're with Barry Richmond, who is like you know, the greatest unknown guitar player. And I'm so glad he's on the show because I want everybody to get turned on to his music. Uh, before we get moving, I just want to thank Doug Bossy and Charlie Gilbert for turning me on to um, Barry. Yeah. So these are some of the people that Barry's either played, jammed or recorded with. And I'm going to like minimize this, but it's massive. The Allman Brothers, John Lee Hooker, Buddy Miles from Band of Gypsies, Eric Johnson, Mike Gordon and John Fishman of the band Fish, Government Mule, Little Feet, Eric Clapton, Les Paul, Chuck Lavelle of the Rolling Stones, Leonard Skinner, Zach Brown. Zach Brown was Barry's guitar student. Uh, Derek Trucks, Steve Smith of Journey, Jimmy Herring, Vinny Kaliuta, the great drummer, Steve Morse, who was on this show a while back. Roy Buchanan, the wonderful Roy Buchanan, one of my heroes. Sonny Landreth. I'm, I'm, this is like every third or fourth name. Uh, Chris Kane, a great blues player out of California. Hall & Oates, Lee Rittenauer, Stanley Jordan. Uh, Wet Willie and Ricky Hirsch. Ricky was on this show. What a great guy he is, man. Uh, Billy Sheehan, the great bass player. Vivian Campbell from White Snake and Def Leppard and Dio. Rick Emmett of Triumph. The Chambers Brothers, Orleans, Frank Marino of Mahogany Rush, Al Cooper, and Chris Hicks, who was also on the show, and just tons more. And I got to tell you, if you've never heard Barry, I told him this before we started up. When Robin Ford was on the show about a year and a half ago, we were talking about Mike Bloomfield, and I made a comment to Robin that you really don't hear anybody that sounds like Mike in the blues genre. You often hear people sound like the Three Kings, Stevie Ray Vaughan, even Roy Buchanan. Barry's the first guy. He doesn't sound like Mike Bloomfield, but he's got Bloomfield's wonderfully soulful sense of blues. And when he picks up his guitar, man, and he's doing something, it's magic. So I all want everybody to pay close attention and get turned on to Barry Richmond. Barry, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time, man. Uh, thank you, Craig. It's great to be here. This is uh, this is my first time ever doing a podcast. This this is all new to me. So uh, awesome, here, man! Here with me. <laughs> I'll I'll be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> the list of people you've played with is not only massive; it's really really diverse. I mean, you don't. It's like a little every everything, uh, and we'll talk specifics. But in a nutshell, how is it like? How did you come? Like, how did this all happen? You know, every every jam, every session is really a different story behind each one. But I, I think just um, the fact that I don't fit into any one special genre, I'm able to cross over into different styles of, of music. And, uh, you know, that I think that really helps a lot in terms of meeting players from different different kinds of bands. 
Sure. What? So have you always been based in Atlanta? No, I, I grew up in New York, born in uh, New York City. And then after a few years, my parents uh, moved out to Long Island. Right. And uh, didn't, didn't get down south until uh, I was about 17 years old. That's amazing because you actually sound Southern now. There's like no vestiges of New York City and Long Island in you at all. Vocally. You reckon? You yeah. Reckon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I reckon for sure, man. Um, how did you first get started in the music business and what was your first big break? Oh, okay. When you say music business, you mean actual... Playing professionally, you know, Playing out, professionally. Out, outside of like high school bands. Right. Okay. Cause that, that was the, the origin back then, but, uh, playing professionally, my first big break came when I was about 20 years old. I got, uh, hired to be John Lee Hooker's guitar player. And, uh, that was quite an experience. I mean, here's this young white kid from the suburbs of New York playing with a blues legend. And, uh, you know, at, at the time I, I didn't realize just, how authentic he was because I was thinking blues oh Eric Clapton and cream but then to get to play with somebody that really did it that that was such a learning experience although it at times frustrating because he wasn't a very schooled musician he would do chord progressions instead of a <coughs> excuse me a 12 bar blues he'd sometimes do nine bars or 14 bars it'd always be different and it was up to the band to just kind of try to figure out where he was going with the music and try to follow when his voice would change to the next chord. Interesting. How'd you get that yeah. gig? Uh, through a nightclub here in Atlanta called Richards. And uh, that was like the coolest club ever uh, back in the early 70s. Everybody in, in the world played there. So that, that really helped. Um, I got a lot of exposure hanging out at that club. Was is Atlanta? From what I hear, Atlanta now there's still a lot of nightclub, a lot of music places. Is that accurate or no? Uh, uh, yes and no. Uh, there have been a few that have closed recently, but for the most part, when I when I talk to musicians in other cities, they're they're kind of amazed that I'm working five nights every week. Yeah, I say uh, wow, that's uh, the gigs are pretty good. Uh, you know, the money's probably still the same as it was 40 years ago. But. <laughs> Uh, some things never change. Yeah, yeah. But at least there's places. If you're busy five nights a week in, in the town, that's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. I, I ha Do you know Chris Blackwell? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had him on the show. Yeah. On oh, Atlanta. I love Chris. Uh, who else I have from Atlanta? Tommy Talton, I think. Yep. Old yeah, buddy. I'm sure, sure you know both of those guys. So you play with Hooker. What was what, – so that's your first big break. What did, um, what did you learn from working with him? Well – uh, how to drink whiskey, <laughs> you know? uh, maybe a little bit about ga gambling, An stuff important like that. <laughs> yeah. A little bit about booty. Oh my God. Uh, so funny. No, he was, uh, uh, quite, quite the character. I mean, uh, you know, when you talk about a blues legend, he was one of like, like Muddy Waters and Howling Wolf. Yeah. The, the real deal, you know, and I probably, probably just didn't appreciate it at that time just how authentic he was you know yeah uh, i interviewed somebody do you happen to know john wiedemeyer well that sounds familiar but uh not sure he, he's out in vegas but he played with john lee hooker as well and he said it was he he said the uh the cast of characters that he had like around it was just the whole thing was like oh, yeah. a, a circus yeah 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 i mean the real show was back in the dressing room <laughs> that's what he alluded to yeah so i'm gonna go down a list of people that you've played with if you oh, can talk okay. about how you got connected with them and maybe a cool or interesting story about working with them let's start off with the almond brothers wow i've i have a very long history with them uh as a teenager i would go see them every time they came to new york and especially at the fillmore east where mm -hmm. they recorded their, their great album and uh, uh, when I moved down south, I'd, I'd been in Atlanta about six months, and I actually get a phone call from Greg Allman telling me uh, that he just 
recorded his very first solo album apart from the band. This was called Laid Back. Yeah, I remember that record. Great album. Really good record. And he said that I came highly recommended that he would like for me to be the guitar player when he does the tour. And I, I told him I'd be very interested in it. And uh, so he actually, he drove up from Macon, Georgia to my little one bedroom apartment in Atlanta. And uh, he came up, brought a bunch of guitars, his, uh, his girlfriend at the time, and a big bag of blow. <laughs> <laughs> um, God bless him. And, uh, and we jammed all day and, and he invited me to move down to Macon, Georgia to rehearse for the show. Holy uh, smokes. But here's the kicker. Uh, I moved in uh, with his road manager, a guy named Twiggs Linden. Right. And uh, what happened was Greg, Greg wasn't really all that responsible for himself in the day. Yeah. Uh, and the, the record company knew that they just kind of knew he was drinking and, it was pretty high all the time. And when it came time to do the tour, the record company said, well, you know, Barry didn't play on that album. And uh, so we're just, let's just go with the guys that played on the album, which was a band called Cowboy. Yeah. Uh, your Tommy. Friend Tom, Tommy. Yeah. yeah. So Tommy and, and them did the tour and uh, I was kind of left behind. Holy and, shit. Uh, and an interesting side, side note was that, uh, uh, Greg had also invited Buddy Miles to be the drummer on that tour, and Buddy, Buddy didn't do it either, so it was kind of weird. But it was really cool because I did get to hang out uh, in Macon for about six months, and uh, living with Twigs, the road manager. And I remember one day I I just happened to take a peek under Twigs's bed, and I see these two brown guitar cases. Oh man! I'm like <laughs> I'm like trembling. I pull one out. And it's Dickie Betts' gold top that he used at the Fillmore. Except, oh. it, <clears throat> except it was broken in seven pieces. He, he got drunk and smashed this guitar once. Uh, I, I heard they did put it back together again, which is cool. So I grabbed the next case, and it was Dwayne Allman's Sunburst Les Paul 59. And <laughs> I was floored. And what was really nice was Twig said, hey, you can use that guitar. And uh, so for about six months, I, I had Dwayne Allman's Les Paul. Holy smokes. What was that? How did that, did that guitar have something special to it for you? It, it really did. I mean, I've played lots and lots of old guitars and Les Pauls, but this one, actually, you could really hear Dwayne's voice was in that guitar. Uh, not many people know that the pickups on that had been rewound. They weren't the stock pickups, but whoever did the rewinding actually made it sound better than the original PAFs and that guitar played and felt magical. Uh, I'd have to say the, the nicest sounding Les Paul I've ever played. Wow. That is so cool. What man, that sucks. So, so what happened? Did anything professionally good come out of that? Uh, just lots of connections. Uh, later on, I, I wound up being the guitarist in a band called wet Willie. Oh yeah. Right. I, uh, yeah. Uh, much later than Ricky Hirsch. Who yeah, was well, yeah. The original. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you just meet a lot of people. Back, back then, when I first came to Atlanta, bands like Leonard Skinner, Marshall Tucker, they were actually like local bar bands. They hadn't even put out any records yet mm. uh, until Al Cooper came down south and signed them up. And, uh, you know, much more accessible than they, than they are today. You know, you'd be at a club and they'd be like, Oh, you play guitar. Come on up and let's jam. It was such a friendly, friendly vibe down here, much more so than New York where people were a little more protective of their, you know, their, their band. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about Al Cooper. Cause you mentioned Al. What did you, what did you do with Al? Uh, I just sat with him every once in a while. Uh, never, never really bonded well with him. He was, he was kind of a cold character yeah. when I met him. And he was on a mission. He came down south. He wanted to sign up Southern, Southern bands. And he, he hit a home run with Leonard Skinner. Yeah, sure you know, did. That was a really, really good deal for him. And uh, a funny story. Uh, we were at a nightclub and... Uh, he went to sit in with the band that was on stage and without even asking me, he, he saw my guitar in a case 
on the side of the stage. And he just went over, opened up the case and took the guitar out and he's strapping it on. I said, Hey, that, that's my guitar. And he was like, so I said, well, don't you, shouldn't you ask somebody first if you can play their guitar? And, uh, it's weird. Uh, maybe, maybe that's why we didn't get along so good. <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of a dick move. That's not really difficult. Because <laughs> everybody yeah. would say, sure. You know, no one's going to say no. Exactly. He just, he just assumed he could, could do what he liked. Yeah, that's not cool. Wow. Eric Clapton. Oh, man. I was, I was 15 years old. Uh, well, a, a little, little bit of backstory. Uh, my dad being a a world famous jazz saxophonist, tenor sax. What's your, what's your dad's name? Boomy, B-O-O-M-I-E. Boomy Richmond. Uh, started out with the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra, Buddy Rich, Frank Sinatra. And then he settled in New York City and became like the number one studio musician on the Jimmy Dean show, Patti Page show, Perry Como show, and, and then the Dick Cavett show. Wow. And, yeah. And for you younger people out there, uh, Dick Cavett show would be like the late show, Jimmy Fallon or David Letterman. I mean, every but it was day so of the week. Musically, they had so many great music guests on there, man. And he was like a hit exactly. sort of himself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Dick was one of the first cats to really bring in some, some of the more outside younger acts. So uh, dad called and he said, hey, uh, uh, cut out of school today. We've got a band on named Delaney and Bonnie and friends. And, and your guitar player is this guy named Eric Clapton. You need to come see this. Oh my, how cool is your dad telling you to cut out of school to come listen to some good music? I, I was so blessed, you know, compared to all my friends whose dads weren't musicians. I mean, yeah. dad was so cool. Let me get away with murder. That is so, awesome. So I get there and uh, they're on stage and I'm, I'm like looking at, at Eric Clapton going, what? He's not playing a SG. He's not, doesn't have that wall of Marshalls with cream. So he was on stage. He had like a 57 Strat and playing through a, a Fender amp. And I'm going, he's not even like, you know, he's not even cranking like he used to do in his other bands. And, and uh, only to find out that he, he didn't like that. He wanted to just be a side man. So it was a, a different Eric Clapton than what, what I was used to. So I'm in the orchestra pit. And uh, the guitar player on the Dick Cavett show was kind enough to let me borrow his guitar, which was like a D'Angelico. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I sat in with, with, with Delaney and Bonnie and friends during the afternoon rehearsals, but not during the actual performance on the show later. Wow. So, so you were 15 years old sitting there jamming. So yeah. you, when, when did you start playing? You must have been a very good guitar player, even at that uh, age. I started around 10 or 11. And, you know, coming from a musical family, it, 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 it just came so easy for me, you know, and had great guidance that way. But uh, by 15, I had already learned every Hendrix album, note for note, Cream album, Zeppelin album, note for note. So I kind of kind of had that thing going for me. Hadn't hadn't quite gotten my own style yet, but I was I was real good at, you know, playing the early blues rock stuff. Did you study with anybody or are you all self-taught? I'm self-taught, but I, when I first got a guitar, like 11 years old, uh, my dad took me to a fella that was going to teach me how to read music, uh, a wonderful musician named Siggy Allen. And, uh, and, but he started me out with like Broadway show tunes. Oh. And, and, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, no, well, I'm going to play like Hendrix and yeah. Cream and, you know, instead of Cats. Yeah. And, uh, so that, 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 that didn't last long. And, and uh, I really wish I had gotten to, to learn how to read music. I think that would have been a real plus. But yeah, that was, that wasn't very a good experience. It's interesting. It's really cool of your dad that he, he didn't like, because most jazz players are going to be, are very theory obsessive. He, Dad was so cool that way. He yeah. didn't force it down my throat. He said, you know, I know you like rock and roll, but if you ever want to, you can come and study with Kenny Burrell or Joe Pass or Jim Hall because they're all friends of his. Right. And, and I was like going, oh no, those guys are old. They can't, 
I can't play any Zeppelin tunes. So I was a dumbass, you know. But uh, but it, it worked out okay because l- later on in life, I started getting into jazz, and that that came kind of natural to me, just growing up in that environment. Yeah. But but the the cool thing with with Dad was his guidance. I would say, you know, I'd play him a record and say, Dad, this is the Allman Brothers. Can these guys play? And he would go, Yeah, those guys, they're good. They're really improvising. And then I'd bring him another album, maybe like the first Black Sabbath album. And dad would say, well, they're not really, you know, great players. And then I'd, you know, I'd bring him a Frank Zappa album and he'd go, wow, that guy's a genius or yes. Okay. So at least he steered me in the right direction. That's really cool. Wow. What a, that's really nice, man. Yeah. And uh, another, another uh, Dick Cavett show story was yeah. that... Uh, same thing. He called me and said, you got to cut out of school today. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix is on the show. Oh, I remember that show. He had the white kimono on there, man. Yes. So I got to meet Jimmy during the afternoon. And uh, I was in such awe because Jimmy, he, he, was, he was my hero at the time. And I like, I remember I couldn't speak for about a week after <laughs> that. I just like was in a daze. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, great, great experience. Did you get to play with him ever, Jimmy? Uh, never had a chance to, and I probably would have probably would have been too shy. Yeah. Hi, hi Jimmy. I play guitar. <laughs> yeah, know, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about Derek Trucks. How'd you get connected with Derek? Wow, I think I first met Derek. He was like eleven or twelve years old, and just child prodigy. I heard him play and I went, oh my God, this is the reincarnation of Dwayne Allman. <laughs> and he's just this, this cute little boy uh, playing with his baseball cards backstage. And, and then he goes on stage and it just sounds like a 40 year old man, just phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, I probably played with him four or five times over the years. Uh, I'm on one of his albums, uh, Derek Trucks Live at Smith Soul Bar. And his drummer at the time used to play drums for me before Derek. And, uh, you know, in, in Atlanta, since it is a smaller town than New York City, whatever, just sure. it's such a, a great musical community. And everybody knows each other, we're all friends, we all network together. So uh, uh, that's how that happened. That's really cool, man. Talk about Roy Buchanan. Oh, my God. Roy was intense. I remember just just the look in his eyes when, when he'd look over at you and talk to you. I mean, it was just, he, he was a serious cat. And I know he, he kind of had his demons over the years. Uh, I think first time I played with him was early seventies. And uh, I, I thought I was a pretty good player, but I remember walking off stage that night going, Holy crap, this guy just kicked my ass. He was such a badass. And um, you sat in with him or how did that come yeah, about? He, yeah. He, he asked me to sit in with him and, uh, but wow, what just the power, I mean, uh, and the sound of that Telecaster, it just, it, 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 there's really no way to explain it. You just have to be sitting there to, to see the power Roy had uh, one of just one of the, like they always called him the greatest unknown guitar player. And he's just, magnificent well he had also an incredible sense of blues as you do oh. you know the the way you guys are i don't i can't even put it into words it's almost like you've got a shortcut to bringing that pain which is what the blues is about right on it's into yeah into people's hearts that i mean there's not a i mean there's a lot of blues players but what roy had and what bloomfield and what you have that's not uh, not a lot of that there's there is the difference between playing a bunch of blues licks mm-hmm. and then actually pouring pouring your heart and soul and your guts in into the guitar yeah and i, and I try to do that as much as possible uh well when i was a kid I remember I first started in uh, watching the Beatles and, you know, pop bands like that. And, and I just thought that was really wonderful. But one day I was watching public TV broadcasting, whatever that is. 
Channel 13. And, yeah, I think so. And uh, they did a, a half hour special on BB King. And I fell out of my chair. I just went, oh my God, there's something, there's something coming out of his guitar that I don't hear coming out of other people's guitars. There was something, something really deep and emotional. And, and I was hooked ever since then. And, and I just discovered that the guitar is really a tool for expressing your feelings. And I was a very shy kid growing up. Um, uh, uh, people that have sh shaken my hand know that I have a very bad, uh, like a psoriasis, dry skin problem. Mm. So, it, uh, you know, kids used to make fun of me. So I had all these really sad feelings growing up. And I think just uh, I locked myself in my room and let the guitar take over. So that's, that's where that emotion comes from. As an adult now, are you better expressing yourself through your guitar or through words, like in a relationship? Because some guys I'll talk to, like, um, they'll say, you know, my wife. No, I read an article about Gilmore recently, and he was saying how, because he's a quiet guy. And um, he said, my wife says I should never speak in an interview. I should bring, <laughs> I should bring my guitar because it's, I communicate much better through that. Uh, I, I, I think I do uh, probably better with the guitar and it's, uh, and it's a different kind of level than uh, speaking. Yeah. Although I, I hope I'm doing okay today. Oh dude, you're doing great, man. This is awesome. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, um, the guitar, can make sounds and emotions that you probably can't use words for. There's just no description, but, um, and it has come in handy. There have been times when, uh, you know, during a, a breakup with a woman and your guitar is the only thing that can keep you from going insane. Yeah. man. And you get, you get on stage and pe people don't know it, but while your guitar is screaming, your soul is screaming at the same time. And you just, try to you channel that into your fingers and yeah. well you got a magic gift about how you're doing it so um, thank you you're welcome and i mean that sincerely man talk if from roy what did what was the biggest takeaway you got from roy wow good question uh well one one was that uh he he didn't really play by the rules in terms of uh, trying to become a pop star and things like that. He really held his integrity and played, played what he wanted to play. There's a, there's a famous story where he turned down an offer to be in the Rolling Stones because he, he didn't feel that was really his kind of music, whereas most people would have jumped at the chance. Sure. You, you had mentioned his demons. Was, was it apparent that he had issues, I guess, or that something wasn't it's the best way yeah. to say it. that he was a that something was disturbing this guy. Uh, yeah, and I remember the last time I saw him, uh, he he had shaved his head bald, which a lot of people do, but but back then that was actually considered a sign that something was wrong when somebody oh, does. Oh, really? It was a, like an early indication of some, some sort of mental illness or depression. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, and then about a month later, we we heard this what happened to him in jail. Wow, wow. Yeah, I'm I'm sure there are books out with a lot a lot more detail than that. Yeah, but he was always very nice. I remember he let me play his guitars and things like that. That's cool. Warren Haynes. Wow, Warren, man, he's a badass. I really? love Warren. Yeah. <laughs> Powerful man. When he plays guitar, he he owns every note. He just he knocks you over with it. And I've got gotten to play with him several times. Uh, uh, he was nice enough to invite me to play on a, a government mule album. Which one? It's called Millennium. Yeah, yeah. That was a tribute to um, Alan Woody, right? Was that uh, it? Uh, it? Yeah, I think. Well, I'm trying to remember. It came out in two thousand. So I'm. Um, I'm trying to remember if Alan was still around at that time. Maybe. I, I, I have that record. It's a great record. I have yeah, It's it. like a three record set. Yes. Yes. And it was a recorded live. I think the night of, they called it Y2K. 
Yes, New, right. New Year's Eve, and we all thought all the amps were going to blow up at midnight. Yeah, I remember that. And, uh, nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and also getting to play with him and the Almond Brothers. It's just, you know, it's, it's like being on stage with a freight train behind you. It's just so powerful. Yeah, man. What What would you say – We've discussed a lot of things. What would you say for you are the top three musical experiences you've had for any reason? Could be like you were on or the vibe, the hang, just anything. The oh, venue. goodness. Um, oh, the first one that always pops into mind was uh, sitting in with Les Paul. I mean, that, that's something that I wouldn't have even thought about putting on my bucket list because I just thought that's never going to happen. But that that was amazing because he's he's one of the greatest of all time, not to mention all his inventions and things like that. So uh, I brought my '58 Les Paul up to New York City and uh, at the Iridium. At, yeah, yeah. At, the, at the Iridium. And I remember uh, going up to Les, you know, with my Les Paul, saying, "Meet your maker." <laughs> 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 yeah. And my Les Les was fantastic. I remember it was funny. He said. I walked on stage and said, take off that hat. And I was like, yes, I will. <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to say no to him. Yeah, man. He was, he was very gracious, got to play a couple of jazz tunes with him. And uh, he was a very sweet guy. We hung out backstage and we talked for an hour. And uh, just uh, one of the all-time greats. I mean. He called you up? Did he, like, he invited you to go up there? Is that how that happened? Yes. Uh, earlier in the day, I had a meeting with Gibson Guitars of the New York branch. Mm. And behind my back, <laughs> they didn't even tell me that. Well, they said, hey, you know, Les Paul plays every Monday night at the Iridium. How, how would you like to see the show? I was like, love to. But, but they didn't tell me that they had called Les Paul ahead of time and, and, and said, invite this guy up to play. <laughs> oh, uh, wow. So, yeah, that was that was quite a cool shock <laughs> that's really awesome man what would be number two? Oh, uh, well be, being on stage with the almond brothers is like no other experience you can imagine uh, especially when you grow up and they're like your favorite band and you're like you know you're 14 years old you're watching them play you know and never never in your wildest dreams do you think holy shit i'm gonna be on stage with those guys someday yeah. it's just you don't even think about that and and then to be able to do that, uh, um, I'm I'm really lucky, really really thankful. And uh, their drummer Jamo has become a dear friend, and he's he's played drums on a couple of my albums. That's great, man. And um, and uh, uh, one of the guitar players, Dan Toller, who passed yeah. away. He's, yeah, sure. We, we we became really good friends too. And uh, uh, a guy named O'Teal Burbridge. Sure. I uh, played played a couple shows with me before he joined the Almond Brothers, and he, he's a friend. And uh, uh, that that band just has such a uh, a big place in my heart, uh, as it does for many musicians. They really, really raise the bar for what good music should be. Oh, that Fillmore album is just like oh. it, that's got to be on everybody in our age group. Oh yeah, top, that's in the in the top five at least. Yeah, that's. I mean, that just tore the. That just was amazing, man. You can listen to that every, over and over, and it's fresh every single time. Man. Yeah, and it's relevant every single time. And and I love that they keep finding old tapes of other live shows because, yeah. and and you know, hopefully people realize, wow, they did they played different solos every time. It wasn't yeah. the same note for note that you know on their album. Yeah, man, the original jam band was the Almond Brothers. As far yeah, as I'd say so. Yeah, definitely. I think I gravitated a lot more towards them than, say, the Grateful Dead at that same time period. Yeah, totally different vibe. Yeah. Have you ever been? To, you've been to a Dead show, I'm assuming, right? One time. Uh, another cool story. If I hope, I'm, you know, I try to stay humble and everything, but I do have a lot of cool stories. No, man, just. just that's why you're here. <laughs> fire away, dude. This okay. is your, 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 your stage, your pulpit. So it's, it's about 1975 and I get a phone call from Jerry Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> That's just so funny. Yeah. When that stuff happens, you gotta be like looking at the phone. Like, how is this going on? Well, to some extent, right. Good thing you have your number listed instead of unknown. <laughs> and, uh, and he called, he said, um, I heard you have a 1957 Stratocaster. 
uh, I'd be very interested in buying it. Would you be, uh, would you be nice enough to bring it down to the Omni, which was like the big uh, Phillips arena, but back then, uh, bring it by and let, let me check it out. So I went through that afternoon and he played the guitar and he loved it. And, uh, and then he told me, he said, you know, well, well, first of all, that, that guitar was in mint condition, 100% original. And he said, you know, I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is take these pickups out and, and, uh, and, and stick them in this custom made guitar I have. And I said, you're going to what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'm just, gonna, I just want to buy the guitar for the pickups. And I said, no. <laughs> and, and I didn't sell him the guitar. <laughs> and uh, I mean, he was nice about it, but uh, oh, and the other thing was, uh, he asked me, "How much do you want for this '57 Strat?" And I said, "Well, you know, you're a millionaire, and I'm a starving musician. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll take a thousand dollars for it." What and a he deal! Just, uh, yeah, and he just laughed. He said, "A thousand dollars for a guitar? What are you crazy?" And and he didn't buy it, <laughs> and uh, so I got to keep it for a while. That, hey, then, you know, hindsight 2020, he could have, he should have bought, you know, that, what is that <laughs> worth now? Oh, yeah, now 57 strap, probably 25 to 30,000. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. But, that, but that's my Jerry Garcia story. And, uh, and he did give me tickets to the show that night. And I think halfway through, I fell asleep. It, it, was, it was really during their, their kind of mellow period. But, uh, you know, uh, as I've gotten older, I get it now. I get the whole Grateful Dead thing. And, and yeah. I like, I like him so much more. And he, he is a fantastic musician. I have much really respect. For him. Uh, um, wow. Really? And he was playing out of the box stuff, man. He had all these influences on bluegrass and a lot of country stuff. You know, he was a very inventive. Yeah, he really player. was. I think since I was so young at the time, I probably didn't gravitate to, towards him because he wasn't using the, the real muscular, heavy Marshall overdrive sound that, that you know Clapton and Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page was using yeah but uh now listening back man he's a br brilliant player great improviser yeah. just a different the whole it's just a different vibe you know if you're a blues person it's just not that vibe really you know they got a couple of bluesy tunes but it's just a different it's it, like uh it yeah it's like a like, kind of like a Jimmy Buffett-ish almost yeah yeah I always got the feelings like hey these are just a bunch of guys sitting around in your living room having a party and Right. You know, it was a really, really nice, fun yeah. vibe. Yeah. Go, tell me number three now. You said number one was sitting with Les Paul experiences. Number two was being on stage with the Almonds. What would be number three for Oh, you? good. Okay. Number three is going to probably be a tie. Good. Uh, so I get to hear two stories. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> uh, getting to play with another legend, uh, Buddy Miles, who was Jimi Hendrix's second drummer. Uh, or, or first drummer with his band of gypsies. And, uh, you know, another one of those things where when you're young, you just never think, wow, this is going to happen. But, but it did. And uh, that was such a blast just getting to play all these Jimi Hendrix tunes with Buddy Miles. And uh, when he started playing the drums, it was just such, such a feel coming out of his body. I mean, just like you talk about Roy Buchanan, he was the same way with drums. It wasn't just, keeping a beat. It was sold. It was a magic. And, um, he's got a few solo albums out. They're all great, man. One in particular, yes, I can't think of the name of it, but he's got some good stuff. Always, on, and, on, and of course he played with Mike Bloomfield and the electric flag. Yep. Yep. And, uh, he did an album with Santana. And, uh, also I think he was the voice of the grape in that, uh, there was a grape commercial, uh, and he's singing, heard it through the grapevine. And oh, that was Buddy Miles. Most people didn't know that. Was, yeah, I didn't know that. But that's not all that important. <laughs> okay, let's see. Well, what was the other one? Um, oh, getting invited on stage to play with Eric Johnson. And uh, I, I would say Eric uh, is one of my personal favorites. Probably one of the top five guitar players of all time. The guy is just so brilliant. And uh, I love everything he's ever done. His, the sounds he gets out of his rig is, is just beyond reach. Yeah. I'm, I'm always frustrated. I'm always trying my whole life to try to come close to his tone. Cause that's, that's like my favorite guitar sound. It's just Eric's. amazing. Yeah. But 
you know, the funny thing, I'm, I'm backstage with him one time and he's plugged into a little, you know, a little five watt Fender Champ amp with no pedal board or anything. He's just plugged straight through and he starts playing and I go, holy shit, he sounds exactly like he does on stage. So, <laughs> you know, you can buy all the equipment, but there's something about in, in the hands. There's something in the hands and the soul that, that they, uh, you, you can't buy anywhere. That's just got to be you. I had the, he's coming on the show in September and I had a <laughs> chance to talk to him. He's so laid back, that guy. He's so chilled out. You know, he's like, Hey Craig, how you doing, man? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's yeah, such a real, sound like that. yeah, real yeah. easy going guy. And I said to him when I was talking, I said, you know, Eric, I'm like, um, I'm about 21 years old right now, listening to you, thinking about sitting in my room, <laughs> listening to your, you know, early stuff. And he goes, Hey man, I know how you feel. When I'm around Jeff Beck, I can't talk. I'm like, fuck, that's Jeff Beck, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was really funny. He's very funny. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> you know, I think everybody has their heroes. Yeah. You know, even <clears throat> excuse me, even Les Paul probably when he met Django Reinhardt was probably a, a huge thing in his life. And uh, oh, I also wanted to mention uh, related to Eric is that on my first album. His band, uh, Kyle Brock, bass player, and Tommy Taylor, drummer, uh, played on my album with me. So I went up to Austin and recorded there. You've got how many? You've got like six or seven records, no? I think about seven now. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, each each one has like a really different vibe, you know, for different people's tastes. I looked on iTunes. There's only two there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like part one and part two. Oh, the Blues from Mars, Volume yes. One and Volume Two. Yeah, uh, those are probably my uh, fifth and sixth albums. Uh, all the early ones, I'm really surprised that they're not on there. But at the same time, if people want them, they'll have to come directly to. Uh, go to my Barry site. Richman. Yeah, go to barryrichman.com and you can get them. It's R I C H M A N dot com. Yep. Okay, so let's go back. Um, Once you started playing, I would imagine there was nothing you were going to play, period. There wasn't any, like, plan B. Exactly. Yeah. I, I never, never even thought about doing anything else. Uh, once I started playing, it was – and it was a family thing. Dad played and my two brothers played. So, yeah, there was, there was never even any thought of ever wanting to do anything else. Both your brothers are professional musicians also? Uh, at one time they were, now they're, they're not. Okay. When you started playing, were there any kind of like uh, signals or signs that, okay, this is, you know, you, things are progressing for you, you're, you know, or was there, was there resistance or did everything organically start working sort of pretty much right away? It, it, it really did click right away. Um, as a matter of fact, somebody, an old friend from back in New York sent me, uh, he had burned some CDs of some reel-to-reel -reel tapes of me jamming in his basement when I was like 13 or 14. And I'm listening to it and I'm going, wow, that pretty much sounds like I do right now, except without the more advanced jazz. And my timing was probably off, but uh, the essence of the emotion was, was always there. That's great. And it was because it was in the family business, I guess it was like almost expected. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Whereas a, whereas a lot of people maybe got a guitar or drums because they, they thought, Oh, this is great. You know, I can be, be more popular and meet, meet chicks and stuff. Right. To me, it was more of a, just a family tradition, you know? And, uh, so I, I think that just really, really helped me just follow the, the straight path of going towards music for the sake of music as opposed to music for the sake of becoming a pop star or becoming rich and you know yeah, yeah. music was the main focus i have interviewed like 550 <coughs> and that is 100 percent consistent for every single one of them wow with rare exception you know the, the that's just the way it is it's like there was no plan b and i wanted to do this because i love music and and 
like yourself, most of the guys still feel that same way today as they did 40 years ago or 30 or 20 years ago when they started, which is, you know, it's such a nice thing to see, you know, that passion. Yeah. Any, um, how about any low points, Barry, or dark periods you've had to deal with through life and how'd you get through them? Well, um, I'm, I'm so far, I've been very blessed to have just a wonderful life and, uh, everything's been great except the only time I've ever experienced like real, you know, uh, <laughs> horrific pain was when, uh, you know, during a breakup Yeah, and, uh, it, it always killed me. It was just, it was such agony, especially like when you're engaged and all of a sudden she's gone and you know, things like that. That just, yeah, that would hurt anybody. It's, it's, man. Just, a, it's just the biggest hurt. And, um, and, and I was always, uh, I always had a tendency to go after like the really good looking blondes. And these were like, like, uh, strippers or this one girl was in a issue of playboy and like, you know, models and things like that. And, uh, and of course they're all nuts. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, the last one was, uh, was bipolar, and, wow. uh, you know, so so it's my own, my own stupidity, you know, that <laughs> it's funny, man. I went to, um, my wife and I went to a, some counseling many years ago and the therapist made a comment and she said, uh, the context of it, I'll tell you how long ago it is. She said, you know, most people have a relationship. It ends. Then they go into a smoke filled room in a crowded bar and they pick the exact same person, <laughs> you know? And so yeah. I think that's, that's pretty true. Yeah. But, yeah. but I have, I have had some wonderful relationships uh, besides the crazy ones too. So cool. You you never been married or no? I uh, got married once when I was about 20 years old and it lasted less than a year. I remember her wow. saying, uh, you are going to put that thing away and get a job. Right. I was like, no, that's not an option. Oh, wow. So was, like, yeah. Put the guitar away? Yeah. And I mean, she knew that. She knew I was a musician when we met. So, yeah, I was going to say, were you not, you were doing that when you, wow. It's funny how sometimes people like feel, oh, I can fix this guy or I could fix this person. Like, man, what you get is yeah, what you get. Uh -huh. And, you know exactly it's like uh <laughs> someone's broken in your eyes they're going to be broken afterwards it's not like you're you know you, you can't uh, fix broken yeah a mission you know wow <laughs> any um on the flip side of that is there any uh, one or two things that you did which at the time were like a little overwhelming and out of your comfort zone but turned out to be really good moves for you that you did them um I think um, going to Europe to tour, uh, I was a little scared of, of that at first because it's, it's a long ride. And, uh, but it turned out to be like one of the, the best things I've ever done in my life was going overseas and playing. Was, uh, they just have such a love for American music over there. It was, it was a real joy. What's your favorite place you've traveled? Oh, goodness. Um, well, in Europe, I, d I did 10 cities in Poland of all places. Uh, and they flew me over there, had a band rehearsed for me. And uh, you know, it was not, they just treat, treat American musicians with such respect. I mean, uh, every town, the mayor of the town would come out and bring us flowers. And, wow. And uh, every city was on local TV. Uh, there's even, a, I've got a photo of uh, the band, uh, the name of the band, like, the whole side of a building, they put the name up. And I mean, it was, it was just really cool. Yeah, it cool. Made, made you feel good. That's very cool, man. Yeah. I've got a couple of uh, buddies that came from Poland and they're always saying how it's just a really nice place to go. The people are really cool. It's just it was, the architecture and everything is really beautiful. Yes. Right? The arts are beautiful and the, the friendly people, the food is great. And, and the way of life, uh, normally I wouldn't get up in the mornings, but, there it was so nice i would wake up in the mornings i would walk to the town square and just walk all day because it was just so so nice and uh, it, was, cool. it just seemed like uh healthier living there yeah that's nice man 
Hey, let's take, let's talk about some gear for a minute. <laughs> What's your go-to guitar right now? And what other two or three would round out the rest? And also has that changed over the years? Oh, it, man, it changes weekly, monthly. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm up to about 40 guitars now. That's, that's still pretty reasonable for a guy that's been playing as many, you know, you've Maybe. been playing half a century. Yeah, yeah, I mean, compared to Keith Richards and David Gilmore, <laughs> and, uh, you know. No, no, I mean, being a, you know, working musician, uh, uh, you don't have as much money to spend on guitars yeah. as they would. But uh, uh, there's probably 10 of them in the hallway on the way out the door. And uh, so there's, I love, I've got a 71 Flying V, the 68 Paisley Kelly, uh, 55 Les Paul Custom, a 58 Sunburst Les Paul, uh, and various Strats, uh, 54, 59 Fiesta Red. And that's beautiful. Uh, I mean, this, I can go on and on, but uh, you know, it, it's hard to pick out a favorite. Uh, a favorite actually being any guitar that's staying in tune that night is, could be my favorite <laughs> guitar. It's funny because you, um, you, most of the guys we've talked about, they're all Gibson guys with a big, fat, middle, fuzzy, you know, brown sound, and that you play that telly quite often. That that is a very unusual telly that doesn't doesn't sound like your traditional telly. It's a very, like you say, a very brown sounding telly. How'd you come across? That's a 68 Paisley. How'd you come across that? Uh, I was in a music store when this old country picker came in and he brought that in. I, I'm, I'm sure he got tired of people making jokes about a, a pink Paisley guitar, uh, you know, but uh, he, he let it go. I think, I think I picked it up for about $700. And they're, a 68? Yeah, I think they're, they're going for about 20 grand now. If you can Yeah. Holy crap. That's a great but, deal, man. But that, you know, back in the day in the seventies and eighties, you could, you could buy these things for a decent price. Yeah. I, I, I can't afford to buy them now, but sure. So I was smart enough to get them back when. Good man. Uh, my, my 58 Les Paul talk about a, a, a good investment. I bought that thing. We're probably around 1970 for, for $500. Good Lord, man. It's, it's do, probably, do you know Greg Mar Martin? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Do you know Greg Martin? Uh, through Facebook, we're buddies, but we've never actually met in person. And uh, last time we spoke, we talked about getting together and doing some picking. Great guy. He's got a 58. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a great, He he's one of the warmest, nicest, but you guys would get along great, man. Uh, yeah, I look forward to meeting him in person. Real sweet guy, man. Wow, five hundred bucks. That's amazing. Oh, and I remember remember the look on my parents' face when I asked if I could borrow five hundred dollars. They thought I was nuts for a guitar. What are you crazy? Wow. <laughs> what are you playing out of most of the time? Oh, um yeah, stage play. rig? Yeah. Uh I have one that's that's usually my always my go to. And pe people just don't understand it, but I have a solid state PV. It's called a, a special 130 that they made back in the 80s. And uh, Scott Henderson and Jimmy Herring turned me on to this amp, and I've been in love with it ever since. So I'll use that as my main amp, but when I run stereo with two amps, my second amp is a tube amp. So I have a, a 61 Fender Pro, a 63 Brown Face Deluxe, a 61 Blonde Fender Twin, uh, 64 blackface vibe reverb. So I get it. I get a nice mix between the tube and the solid state working together real nice. So various old fenders. It's pretty much. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do have a, a hundred watt Marshall stack that I bought from Manny's music, New York city. Back oh, there. sure. 48th street, man. But it's in my basement and I can't even carry it up my steps anymore. Yeah. And, and even if I were to get it to a gig, the first thing they would do is turn that thing down. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what are you going to wow. do with something that powerful? Yeah. What's the best amp and best guitar you've ever played or owned? Okay, well, well, the first one that comes to mind, of course, was Dwayne Allman's Les Paul. That was just magic that I'll never find again. Uh, 
Uh, you know, my, my 59 Strat is amazing. I've got a 61 Burgundy Mist. That's, that's uh, lovely. Um, I mean, they're, they're all like children. It's really, really hard to pick out one. Yeah, I hear you. And, and, I, and I like, well, growing up, I remember I only owned one guitar. And I used to be scared to death if I was at a club and somebody say, hey, come on stage and just use my guitar and sit in. And I'd be like, no, if I don't, if I don't have my own guitar there, I can't play. Yeah. So having all these guitars, every night I'll pull out a different guitar and it re really keeps you fresh, you know, especially since I'm playing so much. It's nice to have a different guitar every night. That's funny that you got a flying V. Do you use that a lot? Yes. And, and, it's, and it's another thing, just kind of like, like that Telecaster. People see the flying V and they expect me to play some Michael Schenker. Or, right. you know. <laughs> that's, what I, that's the first thing I think of every time I see a and, V. And I can use the V. It's all mahogany. It's warm. I can use it on bebop jazz gigs and it gets a, such a beautiful tone. It really, really is a sweet sounding guitar. And the neck on it is perfect for my small hands. So it's like a like an uh, an Albert King sound or um, what's his name Lonnie Mac maybe no no th because this theirs were made out of the original Corina wood in the late fifties. This is a seventies model that's all mahogany, so it's a much more warmer sound than those Corina ones. Thanks. I learned the amount of wisdom and knowledge I get. I've learned and doing all these interviews is oh, like, I can, I can imagine. I, yeah. I wish I had like this sliver of everybody's talent. Well, how, <laughs> how, how are you doing with your music? You practice every day? Yeah, I try to now. Yeah. I, I go and say, I go in phases. Like I practice every day or then I'll not practice for two weeks. And that's, it's like getting off your diet for two weeks. Oh, you man. can't. Really, yeah. Just, yeah. You lose like, your calluses. Yeah, totally. But, but you mentioned, you mentioned you started later in life. Yeah. I've only been playing it, a little over three years. How is it, the coordination is a little tougher at your age or no? Well, I was music. I played saxophone when I was a kid. I played, oh, okay. I played at Carnegie Hall. So I'm musically inclined. My ear is great, you know, and it's almost like I know what to play. I just don't need, I don't know um, where it's like my hands can't catch up with my brain. Like I know what yeah. sound, you know, and that's what's practice, you know, to yeah. get that shit together. Yeah, the, you know, the first, I'd say the first five years are really rough, training your fingers to do what your brain tells it. And then all of a sudden, the light's going to go off, and you're going to go, wow, this guitar neck is a lot smaller than I thought. All those millions of frets and notes, it's really, everything's just a repeat of the same thing that you can play in one little area. It's just the same thing up and down the neck, and uh, it becomes a smaller fretboard. That's what I'm working on now, really learning the neck because I know that, and I, it's kind of like, uh, you know, a lot of exercises and stuff and not, but I'm okay with that. I'm not pressuring myself or anything because I know I'm not going to be able to move forward until I have that foundation and I understand the neck. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally cool to do that for six months to a year, however long it takes. Have, have you ever been on stage and played yet? Oh, I've never even played in front of anybody. Oh my God. Scared okay. Well, I'm going to have to interview you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be scared. Shit oh, wait, wait till, wait till you get on stage. You'll be, you'll be so hooked. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I'd like to do that, you know, not too, too distant future. I yeah, just, but it, it is scary the first few times, you know, mm -hmm. and then you get used to the tomatoes being thrown at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, What's the first, you ever sell a guitar you wish you can get back? Yes. Uh, one guitar in particular was a 1959 ES5 Switchmaster. Mm -hmm. And it was one, it's a big giant blonde uh, arch top with three patent applied for humbuckings. Wow. And the whole top, the back size, the top, like super flamed maple. This thing was gorgeous, but being on stage and playing through a Marshall amp, as soon as you put the volume hit about five, it, the thing just fed back totally like crazy. You just couldn't to stop totally it. Hollow. You couldn't do anything with it. Mm. So at the time I just thought I'm, I can't use this. And, and I wound up trading it for a 1957 gold top Les Paul with, with, uh, PAF pickups, which oh, was, so you got a good, a good, it trade. was a good, good deal. And, and you can play the guitar on stage, but I, 
but whenever I see a picture of that switch master, I just go, Oh my God, I wish I had that. Just, just sitting in my living room. It's so beautiful. Yeah. I'm going to look that up. That sounds gorgeous. Yeah, it's, it's somewhere on my website. The top desert Island discs, top three, no particular order. And just for today, just for right uh, now. Actually. I guess not Justin Bieber. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. wrong interview. Uh, <laughs> well, obviously, uh, top three. I, you know, you have to, when, when you talk about Jimi Hendrix, you have to just say his first four or five albums, period. Jimi Hendrix you know, as, box set. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, another would be a box set from the 40s and 50s of Chet Atkins. Great, yeah. Who was who was also in my in my top five along with Eric Johnson and Hendrix? Uh goodness. Uh, it'd probably have to be something by John Coltrane or Farrah Saunders or Alice Coltrane. It's just some very, some real transcendental music. I was gonna say, you say Alice Coltrane. That's Farrah Saunders. That's out there. That stuff, man, it's, for it's sure. It's out there, but it's still, it's music that's coming. Uh, it's a stream straight from God or the. The cosmos. I mean, it's it's really some deep shit. Well, let's answer. How about this one? What do you like most about yourself? Uh, I'd say um, that that I try to stay very easygoing. <clears throat> um, I'm very approachable at shows. I love talking. Someone out of the audience comes up to talk to me. That's I love that, and uh, try to treat everybody with respect and kindness, and and hope it spreads. And, um, you know, just to, to be able to, the feeling of, uh, that the soul of my music actually, uh, helps people in some way. I've had people say, well, th this is an extreme case, but I actually, somebody once told me that they were on their way to commit suicide and they walked past the club where I was playing, opened the door, sat down. And just the music changed their whole way of thinking. It was wow. amazing. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty intense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. That's great, man. Yeah, you, you're a very approachable and easygoing guy. I mean, all those things. Yeah, I could see that. It's very genuine, man. Best childhood memory? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, once again, you know, when you, it's, it's so hard to pick out a best of anything sometimes. Uh, but I mean, I have like silly memories of, you know, like being 11 years old and I had this red wagon and I would tie a rope on the handle and tie it to the back of my bicycle and put my guitar and amp on there. <laughs> and I'd be riding down the street with my guitar and amp on a wagon going to rehearsal. Uh, that, and of course the, you know, uh, uh, going even before I was playing music, going to see my dad and at, you know, he would take me to work, which uh, was at recording studios and TV shows. And I remember like he was on the Jimmy, the Jimmy Dean show and Roy Clark was the guitar player in the band back then. And wow. Just, just seeing all this stuff behind the scenes and, uh, and going to, uh, yeah, I was probably spent more time in the recording studio when I was 10 years old than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> you so you literally grew up like in in the city just hanging out with all these musicians yes oh i mean and wow. you know dad you know dad introducing me to people like buddy rich and louis belson and and uh what was buddy rich like you know you hear all these stories about how nutty he was you, you know yes you do hear those stories uh but my dad always said that him and buddy got along they never had once had a fight or argument. And he said that really deep down inside, not many people saw this other side of buddy that was extremely, you know, uh, laid back and, and kind, but, but he didn't show that much out in public. Yeah. It's funny how some people are like that. Cause so, some, you know, someone somewhere is saying that about Al Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it's just, yeah. You know, I mean, it's yeah. weird that people have sometimes the, um, a bit of a gruff exterior as they're sort of, they lead with that. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Who's had the biggest influence on you both musically and then personally? Well, I'd, I'd have to say my father, of course. Yeah. I mean, he was, you know, from the day I was born, it was always great music playing in the house. 
and and if it wasn't albums you i would hear him practicing every day and uh and it's weird because he never we never once sat down and played together he never said here's how you play this lick and how you do this and that but as i've gotten older i'll play a lick and i'll think wow i just came up with this really cool phrase and then i'll listen to one of his albums and i'll go oh that's where i stole it from just you know hearing something my whole life you know, just you absorb it so you have a lot of your dad's uh, musical dna yes yes i do um and and also of course i have have the dry skin problem that he had i inherited that <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it's funny he's <clears throat> he's in a movie from the 1940s called the fabulous dorsey's about tommy dorsey and uh for those of you uh, that may be young, the, the Dorsey Orchestra would be like the Rolling Stones or Led Zeppelin, but back in their day. So they actually, they did this movie and he, he takes a close up of, of dad uh, playing a solo in the movie. And it's funny cause you could, you could see his hands look just like my hands, you know, the skin and everything. Wow. It's pretty wild. That, that is wild. And it's Boomy with your dad, Boomy Richmond. Boomy Richmond. I think he's on the Wikipedia for more information. That's really cool. That must be pretty cool. It's, um, it's great to like see video of my dad when, when he's a lot younger than I am now. Yeah. You know, like when he's like 29, 30 years old and he was, he was playing with the greatest band back then. That's so cool, man. Two more questions, man. And I can't thank That's you. Enough no. for your time. Uh, any hobbies or interests outside of music? Uh, well, uh, first I got to say most of my hobbies are music related. Vintage amps, vintage guitars, tons of vintage pedals. Uh, I've been collecting albums and CDs my whole life. I'm just bootlegs and all kinds of great things. I love bootlegs. <laughs> so, so I like I like all these old things and old music posters and literature, except I like my women young. That's weird. But uh, <laughs> but uh, out, outside of music, uh, uh, I started collecting vintage Western wear that look really cool on stage. All the embroidery, and as it turns out, these shirts are actually starting to become as collectible as old guitars. So really, there you yeah. go, man. And then for a while, uh, I had a couple of uh, Porsches, uh, 1978, 928, and 1986, 944. And Those things are expensive to maintain, man. That's, that's the thing. I'm like going, wow, this is a very expensive hobby. You know, yeah. oil changed, oil changed $1,000. <laughs> it, wow. it was crazy. So they're just sitting around right now. <laughs> wow. That's interesting, man. Vintage Western wear. There's probably tons of places in Atlanta to get stuff like that, too. Uh, uh, on, on one level. But the ones that I was collecting are the like the one of a kind that were handmade in Hollywood that, uh, I mean, they're going for like five, six hundred dollars a shirt. I mean, it's insane. Wow. Wow. And, and some of them were actually, I have some stuff that was actually worn by Porter Wagner. I think I have a a shirt that belonged to Marty Stewart and you know, they're the real, real intricate embroidering with rhinestones and stuff. I mean, they're, uh, each one is very unique. One of a kind. Do you know Kenny Vaughn? Uh, just by reputation. I love Kenny Vaughn. We, we haven't met yet. And I would, I would love to play with him. It's funny. He is. And Marty, oh, they're he, such sharp besides being great guitar players. They are so sharp. They're dressed, man. They, yeah. Dressed to yeah, the yeah, nines. yeah. Marty, Marty has an unbelievable collection of vintage clothing. Yeah, and Kenny's always decked out. He's got this pointed shoes on or boots and stuff. He's yeah. always uh, macked out. And, and what I didn't realize at the time was, now that I've gotten a few years older, those uh, shirts that snap in the front, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I can't seem to get them to snap anymore. Oh, you got to so go walking. I got to lose some weight. And walk. Start exercising, <laughs> dude. One, I'll ask you two more questions. Then. Okay. Has, has your life been different than what you'd imagined? Uh, just, just a little bit. I, I think, um, as a teenager, you know, growing up in that era, I kind of envisioned myself, uh, playing at the Woodstock festival, you know, sure. that's, that's what I aspired to be that, you know, that or the Fillmore East. And I didn't, wasn't even aware that, Oh, 
you're going to have to play little nightclubs and sometimes you play at somebody's wedding or a bar mitzvah, sure. you know, but as a professional musician, you have to be able to do everything to, to support yourself. Yeah. So I, I didn't see that coming, but as far as doing that, I, I prefer that I'd much, much rather play at a wedding than be doing a day job or construction work. Sure. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. No, I totally get it, man. And last question, Barry, what has been the biggest change in your personality over, let's say the last 10 years and how much of that change has been intentional and how much has just been a natural part of aging? Uh, honestly, I don't really feel much of a change over the last 10 years, but I think my biggest change and my biggest growth was leaving New York at which point I was a very, you know, more aggressive, uh, wise ass, you know, back then, uh, and coming down South, which really changed me to a much more laid back kind of person. Yeah. Cause especially back then it was a dramatic, the difference. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, I mean, growing up in New York before I really got into music, I was a hood like, like Fonzie, you know, with yeah. the leather jackets and the switchblade and stuff. Sure. Then, uh, through the help of, uh, uh marijuana and LSD and things like that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which I shouldn't be talking about, but uh, it, it changed. It just changed my life forever. Wow. That's funny, man. Listen, <laughs> let, me, let me tell people, first of all, thank you for everything. You're a very sweet guy. Uh, I would love to see you play in person, man. If you're ever down here in the Tampa area, please let me know. I will do that and uh, I'll hook you up. I'll give you a guitar lesson when I'm visiting. Oh that's my it. God. That <laughs> would blow my mind, dude. Um, let me tell people where to find you. First of all, it's Barry Richman, R-I-C-H-M-A-N. If you're not familiar with his playing, He's got six or seven albums out, uh, and the best place to check them out is on his website, barryrichman.com. Also, um, on his website is a calendar for where he's touring and gigs he's got coming up. On social media, he's got a few different pages. He's got Barry Richmond Band and Barry Richmond Band Fans. Is that right? Band Fans? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Barry Richmond Band and Barry Richmond Band Fans. And he actually gives lessons, which he told me before. So if you are looking, I mean, he plays everything, but if you're a special, I mean, my personal recommend, he's a great guitarist, but man, when he plays blues, it's like I melt. Um, he, he's just a great guitarist. So uh, the best thing to do there is either to message him on social media or go to the contact form on barryrichmond.com and uh, connect with him and, you know, be respectful of his time, tell him what you're looking to accomplish and so on and so forth. And I'm going to check out uh, Boomy Richmond on YouTube, man. I want to see that. That's what I'm going to Yeah, I can, I can send you the link because some, sometimes it's not listed under his name. But with the, the you know, fabulous the, Dorsey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Send but, me that link. I'll, I'll send you an email. I'd like to okay. check that out. That would be okay. cool. Did I miss anything? Is there anything I missed as far uh, as stuff you got going on? Mm, not really. Just uh, uh, some of the nights that I do here in Atlanta are open yeah, mic yeah. jam nights. So anybody feels like coming out and playing, that's a lot of fun. Where at? Where are they and what nights? Uh, every Monday night in Marietta at the Dixie Tavern. And I want to shout out to uh, Bill Deal on drums, Renard Clark on bass. Tuesday night at the Suburban in Kennesaw, and that's with Charlie Korch on drums and Dana McCarthy on bass. Thursday nights, the Rusty Barrel in Marietta with Jim Nicoletta, Renard Clark, and Charlie Korch. And then on the weekends, I play with my band, and that's with Jeff Robinson vocals, Joel Edwards, bass, keyboards, and vocals, and Bill Deal on drums. And I love all these guys, and it's such a, a blast to play with these great musicians here in Atlanta. Dude, that's so kind of you uh, to – not everybody would have just included all those people, man. That like, shows a lot of what, you know, who, the, who you are, man. That's really cool. Thanks. Yeah, man. Man, Thank I've you. really enjoyed this. My first See, podcast. You, I mean, you know, I broke your cherry. I was gentle, and this was great. Was See, great. I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to have to get a computer now. <laughs> well, man, actually, I'm still, I'm still on a flip phone. 
Come so out. I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> Your next CD, you come out, you come on. We'll promote it right here, man. Just keep that in mind. Thank um, you very much. Listen, no, man, thank you. It was really my pleasure. You're a great player. You're a very sweet guy. I look forward to meeting you in person someday. And uh, hang on, let me just say goodbye to everybody. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks so much to Barry Richmond for coming on the show. We appreciate your time. Please support Barry's music. Check out his CDs. Go to barryrichmond.com uh, to buy his CDs. Also to check out his calendar for his uh, shows. He's also available in person Skype lessons. As I said, Zach Brown was a student of his and check him out on social media. It's Barry Richmond band and Barry Richmond band fans. And again, it's Richmond R I C H M A N. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com, sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Yes. <laughs> right? Be nice, Absolutely. play guitar, and have fun. Till next time, thank peace and love, everybody. Me. I'm out. Barry, thank you for everything. Bye-bye.